What would you say if I asked you, what is it that makes a good leader? Well, you know, some people would say, well, they have to have charisma. And certainly there are leaders, lots of leaders in history that we can point to that have great charisma and are able to command a crowd with that charisma for better or for worse. There are also leaders that some people would say that, that they need to be able to inspire you. We need to be inspired by these people. And, and there are, again, leaders that certainly can inspire uh, groups and, and lead through inspiration. And sometimes, you know, people would say, well, a leader is whoever they put in charge of you. And I'm sure we've all had bosses at times who've had that, uh, that, that authority and that power. Whether or not they were leaders, we can argue, though, effective as leaders, we can, could be argumentative. So it really comes back to, again, what is it that makes a good leader? What is a leader, first of all? And then what is it that goes into making a, a good leader, an effective leader? So I want to take a look at that as we start our discussion here with the idea of identifying leaders. What does that mean, identifying leadership and then identifying leaders in, within that? So let's start by defining leadership. Leadership is very simply the ability of an individual or group to influence and guide others toward the achievement of a goal. Now, that sounds pretty simple and straightforward. It is really, but there are a couple of things I want to break out here and, and take a look at this and, and really make sure we understand what we mean by leadership. So first of all, leadership is the ability of an individual or group to influence and guide others. Note that this is not necessarily, you know, to be able to, to command or force people or punish people into doing this, although that could potentially be part of it, right? But, but really we, a leader influences and guides people rather than, you know, beats them into submission or, or forces them to do something. So that the, uh, a leader is then influencing and guiding others. So, and that others is a, is a key component in there as well. You can't very well lead if you don't have followers. You can't, you can't very well be an effective leader if you don't have anybody uh, to lead, right? So there are uh, other people are required for the achievement of this goal of being an effective leader. You've got to have other people who are willing to follow your lead then. And then finally, we, leaders work to, to influence others and guide them toward the achievement of of a goal. It's not just that we're, you know, it's not literally just follow the leader or walking around the, you know, the, the playground or wherever you're at is following this person and doing whatever they do for no real purpose other than to copy them and to imitate them. A, a leadership involves having that goal. We have to have somewhere where we're leading people to or something that something that we're leading them to, right? So leadership requires that we have the achievement of a goal, something that we can work toward. So, again, the ability of an individual or group to influence and guide others toward the achievement of a goal. Now, there are a variety of ways that somebody can become a leader. We're going to take a look and, and just kind of divide it into two kind of basic categories, but there are lots of different ways that this can happen. But uh, one of the primary ways is that they are designated a leader, that they are picked, that, that, you know, somebody in authority says, you are the leader of this group. You know, if I were to assign all you and, and 10 other people to a, to a group and say, okay, you're in charge, that's a designated leader. You know, it could be that they were designated for a particular reason, or it could be just that they drew them out of a hat, or it could be, you know, for, it could be that they're the boss's, you know, son or daughter or whatever. Who knows? Um, but the, but for whatever reason, that person was selected as a leader. So they do have a, a sense of inherent um, authority over the others. And so, uh, but, but it does come with challenges as well if you're not a leader that, that, as we'll talk about, the other kind of leader. But if you're somebody who's, you know, picked in advance or or picked from uh, from one of the higher ups, then people could question that. They may not be as willing to just follow along. Okay? So you may have some work to do in that regard. But it can carry some advantages in terms of the speed, first of all, with which you are assigned a leader and, and you don't have to spend all the time waiting for somebody to emerge or, or selecting somebody yourself or, or whatever. So anyway, but there are sometimes people that are designated as a leader. Right? They're picked by whoever else is in charge and said, and somebody says, you are the leader here. But other ways, another way you can become a leader is, be, is by what we call an emergent leader. So stepping out from the crowd, somebody who emerges from the crowd, from the group to become the leader. And they could become a leader. And we have leaders emerge for a variety of reasons. One of those reasons is traits. Maybe they just have kind of the inherent traits of a leader, things that we expect from a leader. We talked about earlier, they may have that, that charisma, they may have the ability to inspire people or, or, you know, whatever it is, they may have the traits that we commonly associate with a leader. And so they emerge 
as a result, uh, those traits could also just be that they are the tallest and and most handsome or or, or good looking in that group. That's another reason that, that somebody can become a leader. We look for those kind of traits sometimes, we, not necessarily to, to our benefit, but we do. Uh, so for whatever reason, a, a leader may emerge because we perceive that they have the traits that we typically associate with a leader and want in a leader. Somebody else could could emerge as a leader based on the situation or context that you find yourself in. Maybe they have an expertise in that area. You know, if you are um, trapped on a desert island and you have somebody who's a survival expert, boy, they're going to emerge as a leader pretty quickly, probably, because they know how to build a fire. They know how to build shelter. They know how to call for help. They know how to do all these things that you need in that situation, right? If you're in a situation where you're in a plane and the pilot, you know, has a heart attack or something and somebody is a, else is a pilot or has flown a plane in, in some regard, you're going to look at that person as the leader because of that situation and that context, their qualities lend themselves most, most to being a leader of that group, right? So it could be the situation or the context that you find yourself in that causes somebody to emerge as a leader. It could also come down to communication skill and competence. Again, that, that kind of charisma or inspiration ability to do that. Um, if they have that effective communication skill and the competence that we're looking for in a leader, that could lead to them, lead them to emerge as a leader as well. And so um, it could be any one of these things or some other things, but, but we have people that just will kind of step forward naturally or, or over time from the group to emerge as a leader and be identified as a leader and other people will start to follow them then, right? So you have designated leaders and emergent leaders. So a couple of different routes through which people become leaders. Now, I'm, we're going to spend just a minute here talking about leadership in virtual teams, because this is becoming more and more common, right? That we're meeting virtually, even if you don't work exclusively from home, or you're not a remote worker or whatever, if you work in an office, it's still Maybe you're meeting with a client who's across the, 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 or, you know, have a group that's spread out across the country or across the world and around the world. And so you may have to meet with them and lead a group virtually, or you may have people that are just, you know, for whatever reason you're meeting virtually. So this does not have to be a full time thing. You can have people who typically are together, but aren't, aren't and now you're leading them, them in a virtual context. So let's talk for a minute about what that means and, and for a leader, as a leader, some things we need to consider when that's the case. First of all, as a leader of a virtual team, one of your first priorities should be to create community. You know, this is kind of one of those things that happens sort of naturally when you are meeting with an in-person group face to face. You, you you have these little side conversations. You start to hopefully as a group, you'll start to become more cohesive because you'll become you'll become a kind of a small community. You'll create that community in a virtual team. It's easy to skip that step. And just jump right in. And that sounds appealing in some ways, right? To just say, okay, we're here to work. We're here for this purpose and we're here for this meeting. So let's just get to it, right? As a leader in that kind of group, though, you've got to be intentional about building in some things that create community that will um, help people to buy into that team and to become, to feel like they're a part of something, part of that team. You've got to, you've got to do what you can to create that community, be intentional about that in a virtual team because it won't happen in the way that it will in a regular team that's meeting like face to face on a regular basis. So uh, one of the first things you got to do is be intentional about creating community in that virtual team. You also need to set clear expectations. And, and this goes for, for a lot of groups, but it's really enhanced in these virtual teams. Again, when the, it can be harder to um, keep people accountable because you're not there with them necessarily. And you're not there. So you've got to set very clear expectations. What are our expectations? Not only for what's going to get done and what everybody's responsible for, but what's our behavior going to be in this group? Uh, think about that communication charter we talked about in a previous video as well, creating a communication charter just for some simple things like how are we going to log off? And what, what, what channel are we going to use? Are we going to use Zoom? Are we going to use Microsoft Teams? Are we just going to email? we got to set these expectations for, you know, the times that we're going to meet and how we're going to meet and how we're going to behave during these meetings and what's going to be going on. Who's going to be responsible for what? Um, set those very, very clearly in the, at the beginning and, and revisit them throughout, but set them very clearly at the beginning. Uh, it's really important in a virtual team because you don't really have the same kind of accountability as you do in a face-to-face -face team to, to be able to, to keep tabs on everybody in that way. Uh, as a leader, you also need to be really organized in a virtual team because you've got to be ultra responsive as we're going to talk about, but you've just got to be organized. People want to show up. People want to do their thing. 
And you've got to have your act together and so that you can lead this team effectively and efficiently. Otherwise, you're going to lose people because people much easier to multitask in a virtual meeting. Right. Um, so you know, it's much easier to be on your phone or checking your email and things like that. It's noticeable, but still it's easier than it is when you're in a regular meeting. Those things would really stand out. Right. So uh, we've got to have effective organization to keep people on task, to keep people uh, moving forward and to keep the org keep, keep the team moving forward and meeting their objectives. You've got to have prompt and meaningful resources. If you're leading a virtual team and they're looking to you for this kind of leadership, then you've really got to be on it with a prompt response when they ask for something and, and give them, of course, meaningful resources as well. Not just, you know, something something cheap or easy, but you've got to give them something that really helps them do what they need. Right. So and you've got to be prompt with that. So, again, you've got to be organized so that you can be prompt with these responses and, and provide these meaningful resources to people. And we need to keep our tone in, in interaction and feedback positive. Okay? This doesn't mean you have to kind of uh, gloss over everything and just make it all sunshine and unicorns, right? But but we've got to be, it's very easy in a virtual um, uh, setting to become negative and to, to let that escalate very quickly, right? So we've seen that with the dis disinhibition effect, right? We've got to be very careful about that and be intentional about being positive in our tone and in our interaction, be providing constructive criticism and, and those types of things.